I was involved in founding the campaign Walk Around the Blockade. That's why I'm so um, pleased to be doing the first book launch of Walk Around the Blockade online. Um, I returned to Cuba for many solidarity brigades, international festivals, and then more and more so for um, research and academic events. And each time, as anyone who's been to Cuba will be able to relate to, each time I left a uh, greater uh, network of friends, family, colleagues, and compañeros. Then in 2004, I began my uh, to, to stay in Cuba for extended periods for my doctoral research on um, Che Guevara's economic work and his economic ideas. Che was the um, president of the National Bank of Cuba. He was the minister of industries, and he had many very key roles that um, outside of Cuba are not much known about. And that was the um, research I was doing in Cuba, interviewing some of the compañeros of Che who'd worked in the economics field and the industry field, science and technology, medical science, and some extraordinary developments there. And then I began to return when I started work on this book. Um, obviously, I'm, you know, was very fortunate to receive funding from the universities that I'm linked to, the University of Glasgow, but also the London School of Economics, uh, where I'm a visiting fellow at the Latin America and Caribbean Centre. So these photos, any Cubans here will recognise them. Anyone who has been, you know, went to Cuba around this period, a family of four on a bike. You can see one in the distance too. I mean, that was what the special period meant on a sort of day-to-day -day level. Um, in a nation in the Caribbean with no sort of history or culture of cycling, uh, suddenly the lack of petrol imports meant people were cycling everywhere and a million bikes were donated by China, imported from China, and um, also um, uh, another half a million were made in China. So I'm getting distracted because people are sending me messages on my phone. Okay, so why was this book worth writing? Well, because Cuba is a country of contradictions. Cuba is a mystery, Isabel Allende said to me. She's the director of the Higher Institute of um, International Relations. It is true, but you have to try and understand that mystery. For 60 years, Cuba has defied expectations and flouted the rules. It is a poor country with world leading human development indicators, a small island that mobilizes the world's largest international humanitarian assistance. A weak and dependent economy, as I said, dependent on international trade, and yet it has survived economic crises and um, the United States blockade, blockade by the most powerful economic greatest economic power. It is anachronistic. People going to Havana always remark about the 1950s Cadillacs, and yet it is innovative. Formerly, Cuba is ostracized, and yet it has millions of ardent defenders around the world. Despite meeting most of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Cuba's development strategy is not upheld as an example. So these are the questions we can ask ourselves. So what my book um, shows is that the decisions made in a period of crisis and isolation from the late 1980s in Cuba shaped Cuba into the 21st century in the areas of medical science, of medical internationalism, in the areas of ecology, environment, renewable energies and in development strategy. Many of these developments took place under the radar, as it were. As astonishing outsiders like Dr. Kelvin Lee, who I interviewed for the book, he is the chair of immunology at the cancer, New York Cancer Center, um, who is, which is now uh, trialing Cuba's lung cancer vaccine, Simovax, EGF, um, who described the achievements of Cuban biotechnology as unexpected and very exciting. And most of the, the developments that I focus on in my book were emitted from some otherwise very useful works like Julia Zweig's What Everyone Needs to Know About Cuba and the masterful work by uh, Richard Gott, The History of Cuba. But that comes to an end just after the 2000 period and is rather pessimistic about the future. The other point was 
to take each of these stories and to frame them in political economy and economic history terms. Because as a historian, we're always searching for causality. And there was also a need to explain the enduring commitment to the socialist revolution, not just focus, as so many other authors have done, on even minority positions, small sections of small groups, or on, um, or on a minority opposition. And that wasn't something that was in evidence to me from being in Cuba and from meeting people from all walks of life and enduring commitment. This is a picture of me um, somewhere in Cuba. We hitched down the island in around 1995. Okay, so the challenge of socialist development. Now, there's a lot of talk about Cuba in terms of exceptionalism, what's exceptional about Cuba, but Cuba also faces some universal problems that actually confront the majority of the world's countries. How do countries develop? Is it the free market or state action that's decisive? And where can developing countries get the capital that they need to invest in infrastructure and social welfare but more than that how can that capital foreign capital be obtained under conditions which do not obstruct independent development or undermine sovereignty for example selling natural resources to foreign interests and how can international trade be used to produce a surplus in a global economy marked by deteriorating terms of trade now until the revolution Edward Bornstein, who is a US economist, who went to Cuba in the early years to help them to set up a, a planning system. The central fact, fact about the Cuban economy was its domination by American imperialism. Now, as an economic historian, I can tell you that the imperialism as a concept doesn't enter into most of the theories of development. But for the Cuban revolutionaries of the 1950s, US imperialism was the principal explanation for the island's structural weaknesses. So all the other things that the socio-economic ills, the dependence on trade, the dependence on sugar, were products of that. What this leads us to understand is that Cubans adopted the centrally planned economy and state ownership, i.e. a socialist system, because it was seen as the best way to answer Cuba's historical development challenges. But once they had taken that decision and adopted socialism, they faced another challenge. What strategies are best to build socialism in a small, blockaded, and trade-dependent island? Now, this links, this chapter links uh, the current work with my earlier research on Che Guevara and his economic role in Cuba because Che had a proposal to answer that question. And his pro in his proposal was an implicit critique of the Soviet system and the Soviet um, political economy, which he said uh, was introducing hybrid elements, i.e. capitalism within, capitalist elements within socialism and was returning to capitalism. In the early 1960s, Che Guevara initiated something called the Great Debate in Cuba. And that was about which system Cuba should whether it should follow the Soviet Union or whether it should have this independent system. The debate was never resolved. The, um, the, uh, they never came up with the answers. So um, th this is a recurring theme in Cuba, the fact that there is constantly a political economy debate. Now, this chapter focuses on a particular period, which I think is really key to understand Cuba's survival in the special period. And that is a period from the um, mid to late 1980s known as rectification. The long-winded name is the rectification of errors and negative tendencies. And it was a very overt um, change in direction to pull Cuba away from the Soviet economic and planning model. Um, in order to forge its own independent path, which returned to focus on national sovereignty and social justice in the construction of socialism. In this period, this is an incredible period in terms of Fidel Castro's speeches, and he is waging this ideological battle within Cuba. Um, about this period, Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, said, 
the, the secret to understanding Cuba is Fidel Castro is both head of government and leader of the opposition. And I think this is a perfect description for what happens under rectification. So understanding that before the Soviet bloc collapsed, Cuba had already moved its socialist model away and had focused on some of the key lines of development like biotechnology, which the Soviets weren't particularly promoting or interested in, is a really um, important step to understanding Cuba's survival. How did they survive the crisis? The next chapter looks at that question more closely. I think it's fascinating to know that um, actually a full 18 months before the Soviet Union collapsed, Fidel Castro did his 26th of July speech in 1989 and he said, if we were to wake up and learn that the USSR had disintegrated, something we hope would never happen, even in those circumstances, Cuba and the Cuban Revolution would continue struggling and resisting. And this is evidence that they could see the direction that the Soviet Union was going in and were making um, some, to the extent possible, preparations for taking an independent path. The collapse of the Soviet Union, if you look at that, that graph, I've already talked about the um, collapse of GDP in Cuba, but this graph really shows that the line is um, what happens to be the real D GDP growth. The fascinating thing about this graph is if you look at the block uh, part of the graph, that is the unofficial employment rate. So what you would expect to happen in any capitalist country where you see GDP, and we're going to see it, let's face it, as we're coming through this pandemic, um, GDP collapses and you would expect to see um, unemployment rate uh, rise at, at least the same level, level. so they would be uh, mirroring each other. Instead, during this extreme crisis of the economy, a collapse of GDP, um, what you have is a reduction of official unemployment. What does that tell you? It tells you that the government took a political decision, not an economic decision, to protect employment in Cuba. Why? Because uh, employment in Cuba is important for political reasons. It means that workers are connected in uh, their political organizations. It also means that they were guaranteed a basic salary. So the Cubans did what would be counterintuitive to any capitalist government and what would be counterintuitive certainly to neoliberalism. So in their moment of crisis, while neoliberal shock therapy was being introduced in not all, but many of the former socialist countries, the Cubans were doing the opposite. They were using the state and the state protection to respond to the crisis rather than neoliberalism and leaving it to the, to the market to wreck its damage. The special period then was uh, basically a war, Cuba on a war footing or, or crisis management without military confrontation. And it began 16 months before the USSR collapse because uh, the Soviet government said, um, announced it would no longer be exporting the same amount of oil and that prices would be uh, um, determined by the market from then on. But the special period initially was introduced as a, as a phrase or a moment, but it became an enduring feature of Cuban reality. And many Cubans will argue that the special period has continued essentially up to today. Although, if you look at the economics, it was in 2004, 2005 that uh, gross domestic product returns to its pre-special period level. And this is the period when I first lived in Cuba with my sister. And we saw how Cubans dug deep to find what they needed to survive as individuals and as a socialist society. So the chapter covers the state of the Cuban economy in 1990s, explaining why Cuba was particularly vulnerable to the economic collapse because uh, state ownership dominated, its dependence on trade and so on. It also discusses the immediate impact, including the human impact, um, on uh, Cubans, how tough daily life became, um, calorie in, intake, you know, the number of calories people uh, consume fell by a third on average. Uh, but it looks at how the government and communities mobilized to respond to that. It also looks at the process and the kinds of economic reforms that were introduced and how the economy was restructured for reinsertion into a global capitalist economy because there was no alternative 
as Cuba had lost its allies, but without relinquishing the socialist fundamentals. And it looks at how they alleviated a social crisis. It looks at the question of growing inequality and illegality. Um, it looks at changes in the agricultural sector, so massive transfer of state land to cooperatives. It looks at the introduction of sustainable development, the urban farms, a lot of people might know about the uh, city gardens and so on. But it also looks at how political participation wasn't repressed in this period, it was actually increased. So the level of grassroots power um, and decision making was increased and there was also a lot of community mobilization. But it also recognizes that the special period left very deep scars in Cuba and some of the reforms of the much later period which I'll talk about can only be understood in relation to the scars left by the special period. Okay, so by the, the end of the 1990s it was clear that Cuba had survived this severe economic crisis and things started to improve um, there started to be more resources available and it was um, it became possible for the Cubans to stop and reflect on where they were at to sort of take the pulse of the nation again. Now this period begins with the struggle to return the shipwrecked Cuban boy Elia Gonzalez um, to his father in Cuba. Elia Gonzalez was taken by his mother on a, a rickety boat. He was only five years old. Um, to she was planning to go to Miami, where there's a, a massive Cuban community. Um, his father, who was still involved in his life, didn't agree, didn't know. And so when he found out, unfortunately, it, it was a personal, the story is a personal tragedy. The mother dies and most of the other people on the boat died. Um, and this poor little five-year-old traumatized is, is found in the sea. Um, and he's taken to Miami to the family actually of the father. And the father appeals to the Cuban government for assistance in getting his little boy back, which is totally in keeping with international jurisdiction. Um, but it, it turned into a massive battle with the uh, Miami Cubans uh, refusing to hand him over, even when the federal government demanded that he be returned to Cuba. Now, the campaign in Cuba mobilized people. Young people went out and they shifted gear from resisting, resisting the special period to resisting, and insisting that this little boy was returned to Cuba, and Cuba had rights. Um, and that grew into something called the Battle of Ideas from 2000, which it was a, a battle or a period of a change of gear which catalyzed ambitious socioeconomic and education programs in which youth were the principal protagonists and beneficiaries. So you had this incredible, these incredible projects where what's called disconnected youth, they use that term in Cuba, we call them um, NEETs or something, not in, not in training and not in education and not in training, a youth who are just hanging around, they become in, incorporated into these programs as social workers, working in their own barriers, working in their own communities, working out what the problems are, working out how to solve those, and teachers in an effort to carry out an education revolution and to improve the standards in schools and to reduce the number of students per class from something like 40, which we know so well in this country, down to 20 um, at primary level and 15 at secondary level. And you can see this photo here with their distinctive red t-shirts. Here are some of the tens of thousands of young people, large, uh, a, a huge proportion of them women, the majority women, and a large proportion of the non-white who were integrated into the social worker program. But there was more to it, because if you think about the period, this is the period of George Bush presidency in the United States. You have the invasion of Afghanistan and the invasion subsequently of Iraq, 2001 and 2003. And in between that, you have a character who re-emerges under the Bolton presidency called John Bolton, uh, under the Trump presidency called John Bolton. And he um, is clearly lining Cuba up to be a potential next target for US attack by accusing Cuba of developing um, uh, biological um, weapons because of its biotech industry. So, 
In the face of escalating US hostility under the Bush administration, the Battle of Ideas also sought to strengthen socialist consciousness whilst tackling material deprivation on the island to alleviate the impact of austerity, to make sure that as Cuba pulled itself out of the special period, or at least things began to improve, there were not sections of society left behind. And there were incredible programs, I think culminating in this one, where there was a survey done, carried out of every single under uh, 15 year old in the country. So every child in the country uh, was investigated, not just as previous investigations have done weight and height to look for um, evidence of, of malnutrition, but a, an investigation including their biopsycho social situation of over 2 million um, under 15 year olds, every single one in Cuba. And um, action was taken in, in the results uh, as the results were found on the basis of those results. Okay, so the next chapter moving on in the chronology looks at something called the energy revolution. Uh, energy is an instrument of power. What did the United States do when it broke off relations with Cuba, take away our oil supply? What did the USSR do, give us oil? That was said to me by Luis Perez, who's the president of Cuba Solar, which is a Cuban organization. It's non-government formally, but it, it, it brings together technicians and scientists and engineers who are committed to developing renewable energies. Now, the, the energy revolution was a major state initiative initiated really from 2005 onwards to improve both energy security and energy efficiency. And it is linked to the question of US attacks um, as well. Cuba was at this time dependent on old Soviet diesel powered power stations. There was like seven of them. And as Luis Ferrer said to me, with seven bombs, they could have taken out all of the energy supply in Cuba. So the energy revolution involved many things, but among them was the installation of new power generators in, in what's called a distributed system, so distributed around the country, some 2,000 of those. Um, it increased emphasis on renewable energies, the production of solar panels, progressive electricity tariff, rather than subsidizing everyone, even people who are making money um, through paladars and so on, and the replacement of old durable goods with energy saving equipment. So Cuba became the first country in the world to make the switch from the old bulbs to the energy saving bulbs. And it did it with the help of the, the social workers who I just talked about, knocking on doors and taking those new bulbs. And it did it within six months only. Um, also, old refrigerators, old TVs, old air fans, they were all replaced with new goods that had been imported from China. So what amazed me when I started uh, looking at the energy revolution was the fact that research into renewable technologies had actually begun in Cuba as early as 1968. And there were various reasons which I discussed about why more progress hasn't been made in terms of the shift. But what's clear is that there is a major concerted effort now underway to shift to uh, the, the energy mix towards renewable energies. The major obstacle to that effort right now is the United States blockade, because to import new technologies requires foreign uh, access to foreign capital and foreign investment, and the US blockade is extraterritorial, so it is preventing that happen. So moving on to look at the curious case of Cuba's biotech revolution. Dr. Augustin Lahe, he's the, he was the director of the Center for Molecular Immunology. Uh, who I interviewed, he, that this is the centre that has the very innovative, innovative um, lung cancer immunotherapy, which um, many of you, I hope, will have seen. There was a documentary on PBS, on uh, US television, um, I think about two weeks ago. Uh, that is definitely worth seeing. It tells a story about how the Boswell Park uh, Cancer Institute found out about this and ha are now trialling that. Um, and have managed so far to not have that collaboration with Cuba blocked by um, the Trump administration. So the, the biotech story is fascinating and it's come under the spotlight because of um, the role that interferon alpha-2b antiviral drug produced by Cuba and produced in China has played in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm going to stop myself from going on to a tangent 
because I've still got quite a while away to go. But interferons were um, the work that the Cuban medical scientists did with interferons was actually the um, mod became the model for their biotech industry. So their biotech industry is set up in 1981, formally with something called the Biological Fund being set up, entirely with state investments. In the 1980s, the Cubans invested $1 billion in this sector, right, of money at that time, and in a context where it wasn't being encouraged within the Comic-Con socialist block trade. Remember that the United States blockade includes medicine and medical equipment. So while the Cubans still had trade with the uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, they could import medicines. But once those countries um, went through their transition, the Cubans faced a serious problem with medical medicines and medical equipment. So fortunately, they had this apparatus already in place to, be able to begin to produce generic drugs which they urgently needed. Cuba's biotech industry is unique as far as I know in the world. It's certainly very different from the corporate capitalist model, uh, which is set up for venture capitalists and through speculation and with private interests at its heart with, with, for the pursuit of profit. The Cuban industry is entirely founded with state investment. It's entirely state-owned. Profits are not sought domestically. There is competition sorry, there is cooperation, not competition, between the different research institutes. So they meet once a month, they share their innovations, they actually pass on um, approaches and procedures to each other. And some drugs from uh, one institution might use a breakthrough from another and so on. And it is, it is integrated into the state-funded public healthcare system and, of course, the education system. In Cuba, of course, there is uh, free universal access to education, and that has been vital in creating the critical mass of science graduates, which can then feed into their biotech sector. And most important, the sector of Cuba is driven by public health demand, and we've seen some incredibly quick movements from the laboratories to um, uh, public health therapies in the past. Cuba now produces some 70% of the medicines consumed domestically, but also in terms of uh, biotech inventions, it has nearly 200 inventions and products marketed in 50 countries. That is despite the blockade. It also has partnerships in nine countries in the global south. One of those is the China Joint Venture in China, which is producing the interferon alpha 2b, which the Chinese National um, Health Commission adopted to combat COVID-19. But that was not an exception. Cuba actually has many uh, world firsts. It has, um, its scientists have been awarded 10 gold medals by the uh, World Organization of, um, uh, what's it called? WIPO, W-I-P-O, um, Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, world first for meningitis B vaccine, world first for lung cancer immunotherapy, first in the world to eliminate mother to child HIV transmission, first in the world to develop a human vaccine with synthetic antigens. Quite an astonishing record. There is no small Caribbean nation that is comparable. And meanwhile, Cuban medics go around the world. Some of us will have really uh, been reminded of this because, in, again, in the context of the global pandemic, Cuba has sent over a thousand medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and technicians to um, 20 countries. It may be slightly more now because it's going up on a daily basis to help to treat COVID 19 patients. While I have strength and they accept me, I will go where I'm needed. Those were the words of Dr. Leonardo Fernandez, speaking from Liberia, uh, where he was combating the outbreak of Ebola in 2014. How do we understand Cuba's contribution to do this, that it's prepared to send medics around the world? Well, revolutionary Cuba from the beginning has promoted a global struggle against underdevelopment colonialism, neo-colonialism, and imperialism. And they view global poverty and poor health as a result of those exploitative conditions. For this reason, the Cubans were as ready to send soldiers to liberate Angola from apartheid South Africa as they are to send doctors to 
to West Africa to combat Ebola. Since 1960, when they fir after, uh, the first time after the revolution um, that Cuban medics went overseas, they went to Chile after a devastating earthquake. Since then, over 400,000 Cuban medical professionals have worked overseas in 164 countries. That is almost all of the countries in the world. Now, John Kirk, who is um, a scholar who's studied this for many years and has produced some excellent work, he refers to this as the world's best kept secret. And as in Ebola, when people were suddenly, you know, the mainstream media was suddenly like, oh, how does Cuba manage to send people, more people than any other country in the world? Again, the same is happening with the, in relation to the COVID-19. Why is it left to small Caribbean island of Cuba to go and assist um, Italy when the EU has totally abandoned them? By 2014, so quite a few years ago now, one, the, these Cuban medics overseas had performed 1.2 billion consultations. They had attended 2.2 million births and carried out 8 million surgeries. So we can say that millions of lives have been saved and improved thanks to Cuban medical professionals. And at the same time, as well as pushing medics out, Cuba has also um, um, taken in tens of thousands of foreigners who have gone to Cuba either as patients or as students of medicine. I highlight many examples of this in this chapter. One I just want to mention briefly is the Children of Chernobyl program, which is almost nothing has been said about it, even with the anniversary and the TV program. The Cubans um, discovered or you know were informed investigated they found out the the rate of um, cancer among children in around Ukraine after the uh, nuclear reactor uh, disaster and they be began to invite these children to Cuba to La Carrara where they had a hospital to give them treatment in a, a medical treatment a psychological treatment and also in a place where they could rest and recover by the beach and this began, the program began in 1989, and it carried on throughout the special period while GDP plummeted. It carried on throughout all of those hardships while children, you know, Cuban children were struggling to get a full meal. And yet they, they paid for this entirely. They never received a penny for it. And in the end, some 26,000 people from the region, not just Ukraine, um, had uh, medical treatment in Cuba. Uh, just an incredible story. ELAM is the Spanish acronym for the Latin American School of Medicine. After some uh, terrible hurricane, Hurricane Mitch hit Central America and left, uh, you know, killed tens of thousands and left uh, millions without homes, the Cuban medics rushed there. They rushed there to give em em emergency aid, but it was also clear that the need for a basic public health care system in these regions was um, overwhelming. You know, they talked about, uh, Fidel Castro said, you know, um, t years can pass without a hurricane, Mitch, and yet every year more children will die of poverty and malnutrition than die from, from the hurricane. So they began to invite um, young people, students from Central America, from the poorest communities, in the mountains and indigenous people to come to Cuba to study, absolutely free to graduate as um, uh, medical professionals and then their friends and allies around the world said well what about us we like to send people so the, although it's called the latin american school of medicine there are actually uh, people from all around the world following the devastating earthquake in kashmir um, the cuban medics went there and to the um, pakistani administered area of kashmir and subsequently they uh, some nearly 1,000 Pakistani students have graduated completely free in Cuba uh, as medical professionals. And there are also um, young people from the United States, from poor and large black communities in the United States who have had the opportunity to study medicine, which they would never have had if it wasn't for the fact that they could go to ELAB in Cuba. Okay, the following chapter is about Cuba and the United States because it's almost <laughs> impossible to write about Cuban development without writing about the United States. This quote here 
um, is Josefina Vidal, who I interviewed in Havana. She was the person leading Cuba's team in its negotiations with uh, the Obama presidency, including the 18 months of secret negotiations which took place that led to the announcement of the very brief rapprochement from December 2014. History has shown, she said, that pressure, preconditions and aggression do not work with Cuba. For six decades, Cuba has experienced unrelenting aggression from US imperialism and its allies. Let's not forget that we are talking about aggression directed at the entire people, not just individuals in government. This has taken the form of overt and covert military actions, sabotage and terrorism, um, which didn't incidentally just stop in the 1960s, as many people think, but carried on. There was another campaign of ter terrorist campaign to blow up hotels in the 1990s. Um, the US blockade, the longest and most extensive economic blockade in the world. Um, it is not just about stopping trade between Cuba and the United States. It also is, is what's extraterritorial. So it blocks third parties trade with Cuba. So if you're British or if you're Canadian or if you're from um, anywhere in the world, formally, you can be threatened by the US blockade in a completely illegal way, by the way. Um, it's included pressure on regional and international governments to isolate and ostracize Cuba. And there are many examples that we could give, but I um, feel like we can get back, back to those if people are interested in the questions. It's encouraged illegal and dangerous emigration. Two particular campaigns to do that include what was called Operation Peter Pan in the early 1960s, which saw thousands of Cuban children sent unaccompanied from Cuba to the United States, um, and many of them lost touch with their parents subsequently. And then from 2006, um, the Bush administration introduced the Cuban Medical Parole Program, which was at the point where Cuba's medics were starting to go around the world on uh, contracts. So they were being um, basically paid, the Cuban government was being paid for them to help to set up public healthcare systems. And um, this was becoming a source of revenue for the government and the Bush administration moved to undermine that, um, to eliminate that if they could, by saying to medics anywhere in the world, if you go to the nearest Cuban cons uh, US consulate, you can um, get immediately get residents in the United States. Of course, many of those doctors, when they got to the US, found out that their own qualifications would not be honored and they would have to go through a private education system to get new qualifications. Um, and of course, the, the US has to encourage illegal, in encouraging illegal emigration, they have also obstructed legal migration. One in three Cubans has family in the United States. Many um, Cubans want to go visit, either live or visit, or engage in academic events, scientific collaboration, and they often find their visas are not issued. Um, at the same time as all these things, there's been lucrative funding for regime change programs. Bush, the Bush Jr. Um, regime established a normal and average, you know, annual investment, let's say, of $20 million to be invested. That's approved by the US Congress. And obviously, with all this money sloshing around, there are many vested interests. There are many people who do not want to see an improvement of relations between the US and Cuba because they are living off this uh, regime change money or some other way. And it's worth saying that even after Obama announced approach, this source of money was still being invested in regime change programs. And in fact, when the Cold War came to an end with the collapse of the Soviet Union, instead of saying, okay, let, let Cuba live, which would have made sense, um, apparently, uh, th these programs and this aggression against Cuba was intensified from the 1990s. So the chapter goes through and it gives some examples. Okay, so um, we are getting to now uh, chapter eight on Raoul's reform, social sufficiency or capitalist opening. This chapter aims to account for the reforms that were introduced under Raoul Castro's mandate from 2007. Fidel Castro um, ailed and, and stood down in 2006 and Raul Castro took over. 
Um, it attempts to frame the measures that were taken in terms of the problems they were trying to uh, address and the results that were attained. This is important because um, every time a significant measure was passed, the mainstream media would respond with some joy, um, anticipation that this somehow showed that the um, government of Cuba was embracing capitalism and Raul was a, was a capital, pro-capitalist reformer. But actually, I hope that I've um, explained what was behind these, and that was essentially the effort to improve efficiency and productivity within the socialist framework by opening space for market mechanisms in a controlled way. Um, this whole process was accompanied by an incredible um, level of national and sectorial consult consultation, which was repeated throughout Raul Castro's decade as president, involving ordinary Cubans and shaping their own future and securing legitimacy and acceptance for the changes underway. What do I mean by that? Well, so take a look at the picture. There you see, um, you know, average Cuban youth. What are they reading? They are reading something called the guidelines. The guidelines for updating the economic and um, social system. These were issued in 2011, and basically every single Cuban had access to these. But not only that, they also organised forums in every neighbourhood and workplace, university, and so on, where everyone was invited to come and give their opinion and give their critique and to make suggestions. And those suggestions were all written down, centralized, uh, categorized, and, and then analyzed for, um, for how they should respond. As a consequence of that national consultation, 68% of the guidelines changed. So that shows that it was not just a PR exercise. And this kind of thing happened throughout the decade that uh, Raul Castro was in, in charge. Okay, so the Cuban tightrope. Um, these post-2000 um, reforms have introduced contradictions into Cuban socialism. Um, they have introduced market exchanges, uh, permitted private accumulation, and this has led to the emergence of some exploitative social relations, by which I mean self-employed people employing others and paying them um, in, in, as a sort of labour contract. So Cuban social scientists and others saw that were witnessing this process and began to investigate and they criticised the economic reforms for their narrow focus on economic efficiency um, at cost, they said, of social equity. And they demanded action to halt growing inequality and marginalisation. Now, as evidence that there is a still an ongoing debate and that there, you know, there is input to uh, the, at the policy making level, there was a, a sort of, it's been called a mini rectification, non-state license, uh, licenses, so licenses for private businesses, cooperatives and so on, were suspended. And the institutional apparatus was strengthened. So in other words, the private, the non-state sector was gained in. So the state could... Um, reinforce its control over production distribution of prices to protect the population. This shows a long-standing tendency of uh, the Cuban government to reassert the centrality of social justice in the development process, even at the cost of growth. So these measures were criticised because, oh, you know, they're not allowing entrepreneurs to the free reign. But the point was social justice was more important. Now, the final chapter of my book, Surviving into the post rapprochement period was not part of my initial plan. It had to be added while I was in the process, really, of finishing the manuscript, because particularly from early 2019, the Trump administration stepped up its aggression and antagonism against Cuba. Here's a quote from uh, the new president, uh, Miguel Diaz Canal, who says, In the most difficult times, Fidel and Raul Castro went to the people. Under the Trump administration, nothing happened for the first six months. And then from July 2017, we have seen a gradually in incrementing return to um, hostility, um, almost to sort of Cold War, well, not almost, completely to Cold War um, sort of narratives. And up until early March, the Trump administration had passed 191 measures to attack Cuba. 
As a consequence of these measures, including the um, implementation of uh, Title III of the Helms Burton Act, which I won't explain now, but if anyone asks a question, we can answer that, um, is led again to a renewed shortages of oil, food, and equipment. Foreign investors and trade partners have been scared off. Cuban revenues have been blocked, including by a renewed attempt to stop Cuba sending its medical professionals around the world. And so uh, tens of, well, thousands of Cuban medics have been now sent home from um, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Brazil. And they were serving populations we're talking about millions of people now left without medical care populations who had no other alternative access to medical care so the question became are we seeing a return to the special period it became less important about the type vote and more important about the question was the question of how the revolutionary people will survive into a post rapprochement period well, what we can see from the reaction is the state has gone back to mobilizing its existing apparatus to channel resources. It's increased control over distribution to protect the population from scarcities. Um, there's been a huge, a significant rather rise in state salaries and also a push to search for domestic solutions. Miguel Diaz Canal, the new president, was born under the socialist revolution. He's younger than the revolution, and he has overseen the process of introducing a new constitution approved in uh, last year. And you can see the photo here is um, a show, you know, this was also the product of a mass consultation and participation. This is the street sitting down to discuss the draft of the constitution. Okay, so reflections on how Cuba has survived. I think really vitally important is the fact that the Cubans have a centrally planned economy and state ownership. The political leadership of the Cuban Communist Party has enabled them to direct development. The Cuban leadership has also shown a disposition to take Cuba on an independent path to defend national sovereignty and social justice. We also have to recognize the revolutionary resilience of the Cuban people they have found collective and creative solutions to their daily problems. The importance of education and culture has been in inculcating a commitment to socialism and a commitment to resisting imperialist offensive. The revolution has also showed the ability to rejuvenate its ranks and the composition of its vanguard. And the commitment to sustainable development and preparing for climate change are proving to be increasingly important. And the final reflections are state invest investments in science and technology to foster endogenous solutions to um, Cuba's development path and um, to foster innovations. The commitment to internationalism as part of the struggle against capitalism, imperialism and underdevelopment has also been very important, along with a principled intransigence in defense of sovereignty and in the face of external, principally United States pressure. That the drive for productivity and efficiency has taken place within a socialist framework. And now, particularly with the current uh, crisis imposed, which has been um, cultivated by the Trump administration, we see that the socialist state retains the mobilizing capacity to support people through economic crisis. But we're left to ask, what could the revolutionary people of Cuba achieve if they were left in peace, if they were finally given the chance to prosper and not just survive? And that's me, finished. Thank you very much for that, Helen. Um, unfortunately, the format of the meeting doesn't permit for a proper applause, but I'm sure everyone is applauding at home. And people can, of course, um, show their appreciation for Helen's talk by posting about it on social media um, and, of course, by getting the book. So please do that if you can. Thank you again, Helen.